for this session. We are privileged to have Vice Admiral Shekhar Sinha decorated with Param Vishishta Seva Medal, Ati Vishishta Seva Medal, Nausenha Medal, Aegir Camp. Vice Admiral Sinha joined Indian Army, uh, Indian Navy in 1974 in executive branch of Indian Navy. He served as flag officer, naval aviator, assistant chief of naval staff, controller personal services. He served as a sixth chief of <laughs> defense staff. In 2012, Vice Admiral Shikhar Sinha was appointed as a flag officer, commander in chief of Western Naval Command. After four decades of service, Vice Admiral Shikhar Sinha was retired from Indian Navy in 2014. Now I request our chairman to please introduce our speaker and start with our session. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sneha, for that introduction. Uh, firstly, I am uh, uh, grateful to <clears throat> the organizers, sir, organizers to have invited me to chair this session. Uh, Mr. Anthony Prince does not require any introduction, really, because he is uh, he is a man who is famous all over the world. Uh, and therefore, whatever has been given in his biodata, uh, you know, I, I feel that more than that, it will take me much longer than the uh, the, the time given for the speaker. But all uh, before I request him, invite him to talk. Uh, you know, shipbuilding. If you go to the document that uh, Commodore Radakal mentioned about, and you see the chapter five, it really lays down the you know future of shipbuilding industry and which direction we should be heading. Uh, there, there is a. Uh, there is also, uh, you know, there are markets of nearly $12 billion in the ship breaking uh, in the ancillary industry. And we aren't too far behind, you know, though we make uh, don't make very classy ships, uh, very complex ships. But on the lower end of the ship building, uh, we have become, we come into as far as tonnage is concerned in the top 10 of the world. Uh, but that is not enough. That is not enough because, uh, uh, you know, India's stature is much bigger. Uh, we are going to be the you know, shortly within few years uh, the second largest economy in the world, and I think that uh, it augurs only well uh, that we are also a big ship builder. In fact, it is such a money spinner. Uh, it is surprising that we haven't progressed the manner in which we should have progressed. Uh, so uh, there are challenges. It's not that there are no challenges, but the government is, uh, as, as as somebody said, the government has uh, taken its attention onto the maritime sector. And they have given, uh, you know, policies of uh, uh, financial assistance uh, policy on shipbuilding, which came out in 2016 by the present government, a grant of infrastructure status to shipbuilding industry, which means a lot because, you know, you can see the uh, subsequent policies which are associated with infrastructure that will all go into being. And then, of course, Art Nirbha Bharat policy it is revised in 2020. And this is another, another document which is worth uh, reading. We have standard operating procedure for chartering, procurement of drugs, and Pradhan Mantri Matasya Sampada Yojana. So all in all, I would think that uh, uh, with the, you know, with the battery of people who have the knowledge as far as the government is concerned, they have come out with this four or five. But my suggestion will be that the organizers here, uh, they should take out the important points and what is not happening and what should happen those as a compendium and then became forwarded to the shipping ministry uh, from the organization. So uh, uh, before, uh, rather with, without wasting any time, uh, let me invite uh, Mr. Anthony Prince. Uh, the floor is yours, sir. Go ahead and uh, give your talk. Thank you very much, sir. I would like to, first of all, thank you for your kind words. I don't know whether I deserve all of that one, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll take it. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Captain Naravane, who actually discussed with me at length regarding the theme of this webinar and uh, kindly agreeing to me to add ship design as part of the, the topic of this webinar. Uh, I am actually in this uh, field for the last 50 years, having had the privilege of living and working in Japan, Korea, China, in Canada, and finally in the Bahamas. And uh, I'm very fortunate that the company I worked 
I, I work now and uh, own is started in Japan in 1950 and was part of the Japanese shipbuilding story. Likewise, um, I started in China in 1993 in modernizing Chinese shipbuilding. And in 2003, I got an opportunity to come to the country and start the shipbuilding here in India. And I'm sure that most of you are involved with shipbuilding uh, know the story. So I thought that as Vice Admiral Shekhar Sinha, the chairman of the session, pointed out, let us find out why it is not working, why, what we have to do to reach our ambitions and aspirations and goals. I, I in last 18 years in the country, I've noticed that we don't lack vision and we don't lack policies. But when it comes to implementation, that is where we grossly fail. Uh, I'll start with my presentation. So I'll, I'll cover that through that one. So I hope all of you can see the uh, slide. Is it, is it visible and audible? OK. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Audible. Thank you. Yes. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Now, we are, we are all talking about indigenization, self-reliance, and reaching a goal by 2030. So let's see how it goes. So if you look at the shipbuilding capacity in India and globally, um, you can very well see that we have a meager 30,000 gross ton capacity uh, in shipbuilding when compared to the world tonnage, where the major countries like Japan, Korea, and China uh, control most of the shipbuilding tonnage. So we have a long way to go. So this is how it looks in the Maritime Agenda 2020 that came up in 2011. We had an ambitious plan of reaching 5% of the gold global shipbuilding share. At that point of time, our share was 1% or, or about that one. And you can see when, he, when we came to 2020, we actually have less than 1%. So somewhere something went wrong. We had a very good vision. We had a very good ambition, but we never reached it. So obviously there is some, something that is missing. So when you come to Maritime Vision 2030, which came up in 2020, you know, our capacity is 30,000 gross ton and our ambition is 500,000 gross ton something like 20, 20 times what is today's capacity. And just by making a vision statement or a policy, we are not going to reach it. And we have to work out and see what it's required to reach that goal. So when it comes without ship orders, we will not be able to reach that uh, capacity, not only domestic, but also export orders. And most of the countries today in Korea or Japan or China is not running based on their domestic ship orders, but most of it is export orders. So like those countries, we will also have to rely on export orders. We do have certain advantage when it comes to labor, but rest everything, we are more expensive because we do not have a well-developed ancillary industry and steel making for ships uh, uh, availability. And also we have several uh, taxes in the country that actually uh, is also a big contributor of the price difference. Then one may say that there is lack of productivity, but I would not 
probably not agree with it because we have achieved some of the highest productivity in India some years back. So that's a picture. So we have something to catch up. And government has been very generous in allowing 30% of the ship's cost as subsidy uh, and uh, to, 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 to offset the, the handicaps that Indian shipbuilders have. But unfortunately, that has not helped uh, because there is something else major that is missing. And with my personal experience of placing 16 orders in India in 2003, uh, the first one was grand success, second was just managed to deliver, and the third one had to be cancelled after five years. So there's something missing. And in, in my own personal uh, observation, I found the reasons. Now, this one major aspect after I completed my program in Cochin Shipyard was that we lack ship design capability, especially when it comes to merchant ships. So recognizing that factor in 2007, I created a ship design capability in India. And within five years, it was recognized globally and we exported designs, full designs to other countries. However, just one person doing that effort is not sufficient for the demand of the entire shipbuilding industry in India. Therefore, gathering my friends in the ship design, we formed an association called Indian Marine Designers Association and have been talking to the Ministry of Shipping as to what we need to do in order to, to, to develop the design capability. If you look at the history of Japan or Korea or China or Europe, everything is based on ship design. Ship design is the foundation on which ship is built. And the profits are made on the drawing boards and not on building boards. So perfecting the design and uh, applying that design into shipbuilding, you can see that you can achieve the productivity, you can reach the goals. Classic examples are Cochin Shipyard and LNT, which has applied this principle and have delivered ships ahead of schedule. You know, So people have not understood the value of design. And that is why I wanted to emphasize in this session, design is the most important factor in shipbuilding. You know, shipbuilding is only an execution of a mission. And that mission is already described and how it is to be done, what it is to be done at the design stage. So we need to develop very good design capability for which we need a very good academia industry interaction so that we bring out from the educational institutions and technical institutions, people who are employable, that means they are trained even before they graduate in the subjects that the shipyards require. And in my own personal judgment, in 2003, when I entered with 16 ship orders in India, we got more than 100 ship orders. And maybe 90% of that was not delivered. And one of the main reasons is not lack of money or lack of funds or value of the contract, but simply we do not have we did not have experienced manpower to execute those those uh, projects. So today, when we talk about Alman Urbar and we, when we talk about reaching 500 gross th gross 500,000 gross tons by 2030, we really have to fill this huge gap of manpower. That is one of the major drawbacks that we have. You know, when China wanted to go big, what they did was that they declared that all coastal ships more than 30 years have to be scrapped and replaced. And suddenly, all over the coast of China, sand beach shipyards came up. And those sand beach shipyards uh, were building replacement coastal vessels and barges and things like that. Pre-approved designs were available for any shipyard to pick up and build these barges. And farmers and uh, uh, 
other type of workers came in and became shipbuilding workers. And slowly they started developing skill and they moved into small shipyards, from small shipyards to medium-sized shipyards, and from medium-sized shipyards to the big shipyards. Parallelly, the government educational and training institutions were turning out shipbuilding professionals, people who are required by the shipbuilding industry. Today, we have universities and colleges turning out naval architects and marine engineers. None of them are employable straight away into shipbuilding. They have to go through at least one or two years of training before they can uh, have that kind of uh, usability in a shipyard. But when you're sitting with 100 ship orders, you cannot just go out and have trainees to build those ships. So that is, I think, is one of the main reasons that we missed the boat in 2005 and 2006. And it will, same thing will happen, you know. There will be no problem to get orders in India, but the biggest question for world shipbuilding community, can India deliver? You know, unfortunately, we damaged our reputation with, with non-delivery. And you know the shipyards like Bharati, ABG, Pipoa, they are all not functioning today. And they are the biggest uh, uh, stockholders of unused equipment today out of cancel orders. And therefore, equipment makers around the world are very scared to come to India. We have a big job creating and getting back that confidence now for, for us to get any equipment uh, to build ships. So uh, the uh, Maritime Vision 2030 has rightly identified the ship design and the requirements that are there in terms of design and in, in terms of research and development. And as the earlier speaker spoke about it, we definitely, and both speakers spoke, spoke about, we must have research and development based on industry needs and the future needs. So that has been very well identified. And of course, they have identified also uh, the two clusters where we could have these institutions. And, uh, so with all these things in mind, we have formed the Indian Marine Designers Association and uh, uh, about six or seven major players are members. We are interacting to see how we will meet the, the country's needs, how we meet the country's needs. Now, there is uh, also uh, a perception, and I go back to the previous chair, this this one, the the understanding of ship design. The first thing is that we don't have the the capacity, and therefore we have to take uh, uh, outside technology and outside uh, help to design ships. And here, the visionaries of Maritime 2030 has made this assessment that when it comes to uh, complex ships like container ships, oil tankage, LNG carriers, bulk carriers and everything, you need to take 95% of the design, the basic design from outside and only 5% can be contributed locally. And of course, they can only give 10% of the production design. This is totally wrong. I will, as I go down, I'll, I'll, I'll show it to you that the capacity is already existing in the country, but you know, our misconception and love for things foreign, you know, uh, is taking us in a, in, in a wrong path. And some of the people who are involved in putting up this maritime vision are foreign consultants, not any Indian consultant, of course, with the support of local partners and local players and everything. So, you know, as a person who's exposed to grow in the global shipbuilding scene, I can share firsthand how all these things are done. You know, it's not a secondhand news. When Japan wanted to have an LNG carrier, they designed by themselves with the knowledge they gained from repairing American built, US built LNG carriers. I was there. When Korea wanted to build an LNG carrier, they, their state gas company was asked to order gas ships, LNG carrier ships uh, in Korea, 
and the technology was developed indigenously. Today, they are the biggest LNG carrier builder in the world. And when China wanted to develop their LNG carrier, I was there and they told their companies to order LNG carriers only in China. And they asked all the foreign partners and all everybody, you cuff up your technology, we are going to do that. But the design was an indigenous design. So same thing when it happened, India was going after Korea and, and Japan to give technology and they never gave the technology. And I offered that I can give you the technology. It's not rocket science, you know? And uh, the thing is that we have to take off that perception that, you know, we have to get foreign technology. No, and you can see that the people who are working in these technological companies and heading the companies are many, many at times Indians. They just got the right environment to work and they, they, are, they are producing that technology. And if that uh, en environment is given in India, they will do it. I can tell you that I have a team of 100 engineers who are world-class ship designers. And while countries are spending a lot of time to design the ship of the future, we are also doing our part of designing a ship of the future. You know, So it is possible. In fact, I have two orders straight away without the ship owner seeing even the design. So uh, I, I want to change that perception among so many people that we lack knowledge, we lack ability, that we have to get everything from, from foreign countries. Now I'll, I'll show you that similarly they have described here in this maritime vision um, that, that we need to get so much of technology in the design field. Now, when I go to the uh, slide where the Indian designers, what they have designed, you'll be very surprised. This is a fast patrol vessel for Indian Coast Guard. 20 of the ship's design were given to Cochin Shipyard and from concept to production design, the 20 ships were delivered 11 months ahead of schedule and design had a, 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 a significant role in, in the delivery of the ship and complete of the ship. This is a design that was built in, in uh, design in India, including production design, and was built in China and exported. This is a, uh, this is a LNG fuel ship that was designed in India in 2014 and got approval uh, and uh, way ahead of anybody else in the world. And likewise, these are all original new designs that you go uh, and, uh, and you can see a wide variety of ships are designed. So a design company may not have a, a track record of a particular type of ship, but he has all the technological know-how, naval architectural, marine engineer, electrical engineer knowledge to design any ships. And if there are knowledge gaps, then of course we can get foreign partnership. That's all but not a total design purchase, which doesn't help anybody. Uh, and and you, can, you can also think that, that nobody is going to give their best design. They're going to give you their obsolete design. You know, they don't want to create competition to themselves. So the, the, the only way is for us to develop indigenously and honorable prime ministers put it right away, Almanurba. We have to practice that one. And we have to believe more and more in ourselves and instead of going foreign and start doing it ourselves. This is what I'm trying to promote. So, so when it comes to that design capability development, which is the most important aspect of Maritime Vision 2030 reaching 500,000 gross tons, without that, you don't have to talk anything else. You can have infrastructure, we can, you can have trained personnel, but nothing is going to happen. And we, from the industry, we are ready for that one. The things that we are talking about is about seven points that I'll, I'll read out. It's employable graduates and technicians based on a syllabus developed jointly by academia and industry. The entire system of education in engineering has to change. Personally, I have, I'm working with my alma mater. We have already created departments of artificial intelligence and machine learning and robotics and everything, and uh, trying to change the syllabus uh, to more 
an industry suitable syllabus rather than pure academic. So we can apply that in the maritime uh, industry and Indian Maritime University can play a huge role in that aspect to understand the industry needs. No, there's the earlier speaker, Dr. Mal, Mal, Malini Krishnan uh, talk, talked about lack of teachers. Yes, that is a very big thing. A chief engineer getting $10,000 don't, who don't have any PhD, he cannot come and join a university because he has to have a doctorate and then he can probably get less than $2,000 salary. So, uh, because if you change that, the requirement of a PhD and the requirement of an age below 60, then you will have a lot of professionals with in shipbuilding and ship operation and ship design and everything available to be appointed as uh, honorary professors or even paid professors, whatever it is. So we need to change the, the, the rules, understanding the reality. So that's, that's one, one important thing. And we in the industry are ready. For example, we use 20 different softwares. None of them, or maybe one or two of them, are taught in the university. The rest, entire training has to be done by us and at our cost, which becomes a big burden. And we had also interacted with the, 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 the ministry with the reference to the biggest burden that we have is ship design software. And we have requested them to provide it as a service so that we can use it when we require it only and pay a, a subsidized lease payment. This will greatly help to, for more and more design companies to come up because the amount of design software that we have to buy and maintain is not sustainable. And again, financially support the apprenticeships so that we can all take these graduates and train them for the for the industry but we we, we need to support those candidates and if the government can make it part of an apprenticeship program that will that will help greatly the government sponsor research and development projects that is what will help us equip for the future there are a lot of needs for future for example today it is digital ship design and digital shipbuilding. So we have to aim at that and reach there. Otherwise, we will be outpaced very soon. So all the conventional ship design and conventional shipbuilding is out of the way. You know, so we need to, to be looking at it and we must be developing that. And we cannot do it ourselves and we need a research and development support. I understand that 25,000 crore seed money is given for the Maritime Vision 2030. So I'm sure there's plenty of money. So that's one thing. Then today, the designer is actually burdened to produce a complete bid design and give it to the shipyard. And if the shipyard doesn't win the L1, then all the investment made by the designer is gone out of the window. And uh, we have discussed this with the, with the ministry and they agree that bid designs must be paid for. And these days, the requirement of bid designs is as good as a contract design. And we also must have a first right of refusal for Indian designers. And if there is any knowledge gap is there, of course, it can be made a condition. But then all the knowledge will pass through us to the country. And not that we are outright buying an outright design where no knowledge is transferred. So this is something. Already first right of refusal is given to Indian shipbuilders. And I, as a, as a president of the, the association, this is what we are uh, requesting that the government give so that the indigenous design companies will develop and we will reach the self-reliance. And of course, no more purchases of foreign designs without a technology transfer. So this is what I would like to, to, to make the audience aware the importance, the very important aspect of reaching a shipbuilding uh, vision or a goal. And the, the key points in Alman Nirbar in shipbuilding is something I will very briefly cover uh, because my colleague Hari Raj will be presenting a paper tomorrow of an entirely new approach for India instead of just copying other countries, the appropriate plan 
for from a professional view of uh, from the professionals shipbuilding and ship design professionals as to what route the country should take to achieve almanar in shipbuilding so that will be presented tomorrow so briefly here develop ship design capability and capacity develop shipbuilding manpower including managers create indigenous steel and equipment availability shipbuilding is a global business correctly identified pain points must be removed so that we do not have handicap it has to be a level playing ground and provide subsidies to shipbuilding industry but not only to the shipyards but also to the shipyards and equipment makers who are a big a big part the material cost around 70% uh, and uh, and uh, the 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 labor and the integration is only 30% so unless you have good equipment makers uh, and uh, at a competitive price you cannot have a good shipbuilding program so while the government is only giving subsidy to a shipyard but they should also subsidize uh, till it becomes a level playing ground that's all you know no handouts or no favors but if a pain point is correctly recognized uh, till such time we can come up to the level we need somebody to hold the the umbrella that's all what it is so uh, in the in the short time i'm given i don't no i don't think i can share everything i can and talk about everything in detail but these are the key points and with this i'll conclude my presentation and uh, if there are any questions i'll be very happy to take it thank you thank you sir now may i please request our respected chairman to sum up the session Uh, shall we take the questions first, uh, Sneha? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, we can. Sorry. Uh, if there are questions, uh, kindly, uh, will I be able to see raise hand in this? Yeah. Anybody who has question, please raise hand so that I can hand over the uh, floor to him or her. Sneha, can you see any any hand raised? I don't no, see. No, no, sir. No, sir. I can't see anyone. There is yeah. no one. Yeah. I, I think we are getting close to lunch time, so it's a little difficult for people to <laughs> spend any time. Uh, but uh, having said that, uh, let me not cut short the yeah. summarize, summarization that I am thinking about. I think uh, firstly we must thank Mr. Anthony Prince for a very very uh, lucid and a very uh, shall I say an exhaustive prescription. uh as to how the ship building and ship design in india should progress and i couldn't agree more uh than to say that ship design is the key to ship building in any future however uh you know the new technologies that he talked about in his 10 points uh, artificial in intelligence and robotics uh, let us not forget that uh, you know these have to be used to build ships so you require shipyards and that that needs to be kept in mind that we must have adequate sea front where these big ships can be built and for creating those infrastructure i recommend that it should be a ppp model because government alone will not be able to create uh, uh, spend so much of money and therefore the private companies who are likely to be interested in the ship building activity and subsequent business even outside india including transportation uh, including repair you know it has to be a little comprehensive policy you cannot have just one uh, one out of this entire ship building uh, because it will take a long time for any company to break even and government support is required to give you subsidy in the infrastructure development which have changed because we have heard of this cam cad computer aided design and computer aided manufacturing so if you have robotics and you have artificial intelligence for god sake you got to have your equipment and infrastructure in place Uh, so that you know they can listen to this fellow to the to the robotics to the robots and uh, you know the the whole what is called the jigs and uh, frames and what are, what have you they have to be positioned in a manner that the robotics where will the robot operate from who will operate the robot will it be in autonomous mode so you have to get into little detail and therefore not to not imagine 
that we are going to make a futuristic ship and you don't have a futuristic shipyard and uh, this this will require a possibly maybe one uh, additional point uh, mr anthony if you uh, if you please maybe you like to uh, subsequent talks whenever the, you could you could add this that is number one uh, the second point that i uh, want to make is very important point we talked about is the qualified managers uh, manpower uh, right in the beginning uh, you know the honorable vice chancellor of the uh, india maritime university dr malini shankar she made a very valid point that people come to do phd just to write doctor ahead of their name uh, not really to learn uh, you know not really to discover things and that is the problem outside the country you will not believe that many university phd are not recognized uh, and when you when the students land up there you find that you know they are in absolutely uh, grief they don't know what to do they are sent back because by the time they are selected for anything any job or a higher sort of education uh, they go by what you produce so if you if you show your phd they accept it but the moment you land up there you say which university is your so and so university so this we have to change our mindset has to change we cannot remain a mediocre thinking country unfortunately the policies of the government in the past have forced us to mediocrity of our intellectual capital and that needs to be removed and this is a big challenge mediocrity of intellectual capital why i say this is because you know we if you don't invest much in the higher studies getting new technology then you will be quite happy to make provision in the universities for passing out people who can just on their living and these boys were large numbers when people say that you know india's middle class is thriving i get a little worried that this middle class is also giving rise to this uh, you know middle class mediocrity of intellectual uh, intellectual capital and this is one very big challenge which uh, all of us have to uh, you know sort of look at it and how we can improve and one of the suggestions with uh, mr anthony gave was to hire people hire qualified people from outside till you have your own so if you hire people and train the trainers this is very important because these days you don't find uh, top of the line uh, people joining the teaching profession so this is another problem Uh, as i said you know you are only creating people who are uh, who got to earn their living they will have a motorcycle they will have a house and rent they will have you know mcdonald and sort of uh, kfc they are happy they are married they have children who can you know can be brought to school well, that is that is all right for economy but that is not all right for intellectual capital so see this is one big problem that we are facing and whenever uh, you know the rules and regulations ugc rules etc whenever they are tightened to make this work there is too much of halla gulla in the whole country so this only uh, only points that are you know uh, that we have to get over this mediocrity by all means it is not not a, not a dull thing second another point that i wanted to make again it made very well by mr anthony uh, you know that uh, the self reliance and technology transfer a lot of a uh, lot of uh, you know movement has taken place in the different sectors since i belong to the i belong to the navy and have been with the defense acquisition for many years uh, this has been this has been tried for a long time the government in its own excitement you know they gave out that following uh, negative list meaning that you can't import uh, the, hoping that by then the atmanirbhar project will work and it will come out but regrettably it has not happened and therefore that list is being revised time and again only yesterday i read that you know two three uh, items have been removed from that uh, list they, they have to be imported uh, they have to be imported because you can't keep waiting till cows come home so it's certainly not sec uh, security so in security if this is required all security manufacturing has got a flip side it has got a collateral advantage if you like you know what is made for defense for example we have an excellent ship design bureau all phd's from outside and you know they are the ones who design all the warship yes none of our warships are designed outside the country and including now the submarine are yahan the nuclear submarine is designed by us our own designers and it's uh, sailing well second one third one are already in the block they should be operational in time the second one i think i think maybe commodore dhanka may have a little more input on that I, I, all i know is that you know by end of this uh, coming year the second one should be sailing operational so what i'm saying is that if there are people retiring from these jobs 
I think the industry can do well uh, to absorb them. Uh, maybe uh, Mr. Anthony can sort of keep a watch on such people. And if you want, we can all be helpful because they're already PhD. They already have the basic basic ship design in their mind. All you can do is to add a few things and see how they are doing. And I think they, they can be of great value uh, to, to the shipbuilding industry. Uh, one very important point that you made, Mr. Anthony, and I quite liked it, that, you know, the ecosystem has to be built. You know, the medium and small manufacturing enterprises, if they are not there, then you will not be able to build the ship, any shipbuilding. First, you actually start doing a survey of the MSMEs, those who have component level knowledge. They will not have it because you're not building it. So you will have to give them some incentive, bring them on board and tell them that what components you want them to manufacture. And once that happens, I personal belief is that you should always start small. You can think big. You can think big, start small, get the components first. And now you see in the meantime, your technology has developed how to make the platform. Same thing has happened to our aircraft carrier. Same thing happened to our nuclear submarine. You'll be surprised there are almost 200 medium and small scale uh, enterprises who are involved in making components. And we are going to make large number of these submarines. So they have living for so many years. Uh, they will keep increasing their you know, employability of more and more people. And you will require, uh, you know, the domain specialist, not only from university level, I'm you, you will have to have people at the level of ITIs. You know, those who actually work with hand. So finally, they are the ones who are going to sit on call it lathe machine or call it you know robotic machine. They are the guys who are actually going to be operating. So I think there is a lot to do, and I am very happy that uh, you know the uh, the center has actually brought this entire thing onto the platform. And this is not the first time that you are doing, but I think this requires little more publicity. It requires little more bringing on the you know national network. Uh, please try and see that you know you can have a full-fledged program on this uh, by the staff of uh, the center, uh, or maybe you can invite uh, some of our very di distinguished speakers who have spoken on a panel discussion on Durdashan. Have a panel discussion on some of the TV channels. Idea is that you must get to the people. You know, it's uh, people have to be made aware that maritime sector is also growing. Otherwise, you know, it is not find, finding enough traction in the public. So I think all in all, I would say that it's. Uh, it's a great thing. I think Mr. Shrikaran has raised his hand. So what I'll do is I'll just stop here for a minute and take this question. Mr. Shrikaran, sir, all yours. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, that was an excellent uh, presentation from uh, Anthony Prince, sir. Uh, one point, uh, you know, coming up is that uh, we don't have, uh, you know, the experienced uh, manpower into the shipbuilding as such. Uh, and he rightly he points it out that we need uh, one or two years of experience in a yard because we have the trainees, but they need some experience into the yard to you know to bring them into, into the profession uh, to make them utilize them properly into the shipbuilding. We are looking into the maritime vision of 2030, and we need professionals. We need the experience uh, definitely. Uh, and uh, see, sir, uh, I am the director of a College of Ship Technology. Uh, a, a college who is doing a, a course, a BSc in shipbuilding and repair course under uh, Indian Maritime University. We do this specialization course in Indian uh, in uh, in shipbuilding and repair only. So you know what we find is that uh, you know the, in the industry or the government, you know, if you want to create uh, experienced hands, we definitely have to you know take up uh, the trainees and we need to give them the you know training and uh, one or two years of uh, shipyard training, whatever is that we need to give them so that we can develop in the coming years, we can uh, uh, you know develop enough manpower. So this is uh, something, you know, maybe with the government support, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, some kind of a stipend or kind of uh, something, we need to develop them so that, you know, in one or two years, we have sufficient manpower coming into it. Definitely the young boys in the market, they don't come into the shipbuilding industry. Because of the IT industry or any other many other industries are more they give more salary and you know better uh, terms and conditions for etc. The young boys, uh, you know, the better of them, they don't come into the, the shipbuilding industry. So that is a weakness we have, and we have to change it. We can change it only with the you know the government and the shipping industry coming forward, and uh, you know uh, you know recruiting people from the institute. 
and so that we can develop them you know to become the leaders of uh, shipbuilding industry tomorrow so this is something uh, we need to you know even i have been uh, discussing with uh, the malini shankar uh, our vc also you know we give a little bit more aspect into you know into the training part of it okay coach uh, uh, shipyard and uh, you know some shipyards are there but the one issue what we are saying we found out is that they don't uh, you know they don't go for a, a, a uh partnership or collaboration with the private institute they go with uh, the only the government or one or two government institutes only they go but there are very good the private institutes also who does uh, you know experienced uh, faculties and industry uh, people who is doing this uh, maritime training to bring up uh, good leaders into our uh, maritime ship building so the industry need to recognize and uh, you know take them and uh, you know help the, the other institutes and other uh, Uh, the private participation also into the yeah, mr shridharan i got your point uh, because we are running out of time uh, mr jyoti uh, you got some question and mr anthony i'll come back to you yeah. jyoti yeah. yes sir thank you very much for taking my question yeah my yeah. comment it's not a question it's a comment actually uh, in the old days uh, we used to have different trades in all the shipyards and those trades were skilled trades and they were maintained and paid by the shipyard themselves in recent times of the past say about 30 years or so shipyards are depending much more on contract labor and not their own paid labor and these contract laborers from where and with what skill they are recruited is not known this requires a specific amendment to the labor law so that the manufacturing trades in the shipyards the various trades which are there in the shipyards they are maintained within the shipyards and kept with the shipyards and not the crucial jobs cannot be given to the contract uh, labor this is my point thank you sir thank you very much uh, mr anthony would you like to respond sure, to that sure i would love to uh first uh, regarding mr sridharan's uh, comment it is a very valid point see the majority of shipyards in india is owned by the government and the policy is also owned by the government made by the government so they can make a policy that provided a graduate from a recognized organization private or public is seeking an apprenticeship he, it should be his birthright to get an apprenticeship as long as you have approved the institution their syllabus and their intake so for example if your institute is taking 100 ship technologists it is recognized by ministry of shipping then getting that apprenticeship is their birthright that means they should be absorbed by a shipyard a government shipyard and of course the private shipyard too but we we hardly have very few private shipyards in india so that problem can be easily solved because both are controlled by the government you know the other way is a china model you know you encourage the inland waterway uh, ship building you encourage coastal ship building and make it easy so naturally people from the farm i know in japan farmers were ship building workers in korea farmers were and in china also farmers were ship ship building workers so there's nothing wrong you just train them and they are ready for the job okay but they created the huge capacity shortage was was overcome not only by training and education institutions by themselves getting into the very basic ship building starting from a barge to a coastal ship so that can train and the big shipyards can then absorb these people and maybe with very little training they can be employed that, that, that's my point second point to jodi dasgupta's point you see if you look at the right of every business to run it the best way so that they are profitable is something a basic right so we really cannot enforce a lot of things on to shipyard and you know, shipyards in japan or korea or china they depend very much on subcontractors and those the only thing is that you have to define the qualification criteria of a subcontractor that's all so you know the shipyards are only an integrator in those countries they are not builders or manufacturers or as it is they bring everything together and stitch them together and deliver it so uh, i would say that i will not quite agree with the point that you mentioned 
but i respect that major traits the shipyard must have a good grip either they must have them by themselves or they must have by subcontractor well uh, thank you mr anthony uh, i have nothing more to add really except to say that there are possibilities of shipyards adopting you know your university or your uh, you know college uh, or make them aware Uh, that you have a you have an organization like this and it is an authorized or it's an approved ugc approved or which are uh, approving authority shipping ministry approved organization you reach out my i request the honorable vice chancellor and yourself mr sridharan that please reach out even to defense psus because finally there are people who who have to do you know hands on work for apprenticeship you can tie up i'm yes. sure they will be able to even if they take 5 10 people in particular uh, Uh, you know vertical uh, you will have them you know specialist after the after all what you will have a specialized guy who will talk about electricity supply in the uh, ship supply in the ship or you will somebody will talk about hydraulic pumps fitment somebody will talk about fire fighting system now the basic principle of ship uh, you know management is about all the same how it operates is that is where this you know artificial intelligence and uh, robotics can come into play so i i think that you have to reach out rather than just sort of producing people and giving them in the market my suggestion is that you try i don't think that there will be any hindrance or they will say that we want only from government organization if if at all it is happening if you go to let's say mdl or hindustan ship yard limited or somewhere if you are having trouble i can offer my services i can get in touch with the cmds and request them because it's up to them i i don't think that you know we should be looking for unqualified contract labor make you know helping in ship building uh, in place of people who are qualified who have been taught the ship building subject so i think that you know uh, it's a little bit of reaching it's out this only yes so uh, thank you very much all our uh, listeners and uh, let's give a big hand to our speaker mr anthony prince Thank you very much, Sneha. All yours. We are just about three, four minutes uh, past. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for enlightening us with the valuable knowledge. Now, may I request Assistant Professor Vinod Sononi to please convey the. Good afternoon to everyone. It is my honor to propose a formal vote of thanks. I, on behalf of CHME Society. Kanoji Angre Maritime Research Institute take this opportunity to thank Anthony Prince sir for lecture which was full of knowledge and interesting things it requires planning and a bird's eye for such details i am pretty sure the precious knowledge that anthony prince sir gave us will definitely help us in our studies and future the powerpoint presentation was very very informative thank you sir for this Our heartful thanks are also due to our chairman of this session, Vice Admiral Shekhar Sinha, for taking out time from their busy schedule and enlightening us with the knowledge. Your presence and wise words help magnify our cause in the best possible way. With this, I thank our viewers who joined us virtually. We look forward to welcome you again for our next session. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. With this, we have completed our three session of the day. First session was on skilling for shipbuilding, orienting India's maritime education to meet the shipyard industry demand of 21st century. Where we had, uh, as a chairman, Lieutenant General D. B. Shikarkar, and speaker was Sri Madhi Malini Shankar. For the second session, we uh, we had. historical legacy of shipbuilding in india as a compass chart the way ahead and for that we were accompanied by the chairman dr angana guha roy and speaker was commodore johnson okay odakal and third session was atmanirbhar in shipbuilding in relation to maritime vision 2030 the chairman was vice admiral shekhar sinha and speaker was shri anthony prince till now we have done with our three sessions now i declare a lunch break and lunch break for 45 minutes and we'll again meet at 2 pm